What are you doing? Yeah, dude. You, so essentially, you're shooting a smoothbore barrel. <laughs> Any demo that Mickey's done in the past three months. <laughs> he gets a pass. Yeah, he gets pass. a pass because it's not him, man. It's definitely, uh, he Shooting overshot He overshot his barrel. There's really no throat here at all. Yeah, I really appreciate this. I thought we were oh, just going to yeah. swap a barrel out. You guys are. This, this is it. I mean, like, there's a, there's a right and a wrong way to do things. So, I mean, this is beautiful. Clowns that don't know what the Air 15 say. It's like Legos for adults. If a dude says that to me, I immediately... You know he's an idiot. He, he, he has no clue what he's talking about. Yeah. He's in a Lego. Where are we at right now? All right, so there's going to be drilling. This is going to be your... Uh, Right when we saw the barrel, they're going ahead and drill the hole in there before the button's pulled. This is going to be moving. All your barrels are going to be turned over here. Essentially, you're going to be on your profile. Grinding to get the... Uh, Grinding? Yep, that's going to give the, the lays something to grab onto. Uh, more turning, more milling. Yes, more, milling. more tilling, more milling. It's a lot of barrels. And then before I put the barrel in there, this is just alcohol. I'm going to prep it. Because I want that to be full, totally lubricant free. We hold our tolerances uh, on our barrels well inside Sandy Specs. So we only afford a 3,000th tolerance gap, which is tight. And then we hand fit a bolt to your barrel. We use touch base gauges, and I want it to be a tight closure on a go gauge. What's a go gauge? So a go, so our go spec is a 1.46464, okay. you know, a two to three weld. And then we have a 1.4676, that's a 3,000th tolerance gap that we hold our barrels to. Your head space is the measurement from your bolt face to the datum line in the chamber. That's the shoulder where your cartridge stops moving forward in the chamber. I got you. When you load a live round, you want that cartridge to be all the way forward in the chamber and that bolt to close behind it tightly. You don't want a lot of slop, so you don't want that cartridge to be able to move forward and backwards when your bolt's forward and locked. Otherwise, you'll have chamber pressure fluctuations, you can blow primers, you can do all mm -hmm, things weird, mm -hmm. it'll mess with your brass, it'll give you inconsistent seating depths, definitely affect accuracy, it'll give you a choppier, inconsistent recoil because you're not getting the same amount of pressures going down the barrel every single time. So, mm. like, you know, one time the cartridge might be forward in the chamber, one time the sure. chamber might be rearward. Consistency. That's a big issue with ARs. Major issue. Yeah, and a lot of guys, like clowns that don't know what the AR-15 say, it's like Legos for adults. If a dude says that to me, I immediately... You know he's an idiot. He, he, he has no clue what he's talking about. Yeah. He's in a Lego. So what do you what do you got? So it's it's, a, it's our core series barrel. It's definitely our most popular contour. It's maybe like two years old. They're never in stock, but uh, it's a continuous taper design. As you can see, it doesn't have steps in the barrel, like a more of like a government contour barrel. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the government contour is a backwards barrel, and that's why they call it the government contour. Appropriate names, right? But if you have like a thin portion, and this is actually our hybrid contour, which is a mid-weight barrel, but it's still a government contour. So it's got that heavier weight. <laughs> it's got that heavier weight around the chamber for better heat absorption. Okay. But what we basically did is we wanted to eliminate the steps because obviously wherever you have a thin spot in the barrel, it'll heat up more quickly. Okay. And then wherever you have thick portions, it heats up more slowly, but it also retains heat longer, right? So if you have heat being built up and re being retained longer and this part's getting heated up quickly, but then it sheds heat faster, you get all types of harmonic inconsistencies in the barrel. Cause gotcha. Barrels are like any other steel. So by heat. putting the consistent taper on it, you're getting a more- It's uniform heat dissipation. So you're not gonna get those, like, those areas in the barrel where it's like hotter back here and cooler up here. And then it, you know, it's, you know, it's retaining heat and shedding heat. As you're shooting long strings of fire, say mm -hmm. a carving class or something like that, especially like an accuracy intensive carving class, you want consistency. Sure. Also, 
if you look at any type of like modern accessories, they're all off the front of your gun, right? So having a lightweight front end, obviously on a 10.5, it's not as much of a difference. Mm -hmm. But you get like a 14.5 with a suppressor out front and an IR laser and a bipod maybe, and you have an LP. Sure. You, your gun's going to be like a tank. And if it's front heavy, it's going to slow you down, make you less effective with your gun, right? So we light up the, lighten up the front end where all your accessories are, where you don't need the weight for heat absorption because the vast majority of the heat takes place in the first five inches of the barrel right around the chamber. So you have better heat absorption, better balance, faster gun, better be, you know better balance equals better handling, faster target transitions, faster on target. It's a benefit. So I dig it. Yeah, it's it, it's just you know it's like a little bit of it's nothing groundbreaking. Every precision bolt gun barrel that's ever existed is a continuous taper. Why the AR-15 government contour exists? no idea we'll continue to make them for like retro guns i guess people want them yeah i suppose but yeah i mean all things being equal you're going to see more and more barrels looking like this moving forward so i'm, I'm not only going to heat this up and thermo fit it i'm also going to bed it it's going to be a super tight fitment between your barrel extension and your upper receiver that's going to make it as much of a one piece rigid upper as possible mm. and your little 10.5 will shoot a quarter inch screw when it's all said and done, as long as everything's done correctly. So I like to use like some type of green sleeve retaining compound because it expands when it dries and it's designed for like slip fit joints. Like this is a slip fit joint. It's perfect for that. This guy doesn't know what the talking about. Not a clue. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty sure he doesn't shoot. And I like to go heavy on it too, so. Anything that doesn't want to stay in there will just kind of ooze out anyway and I'll wipe it off. Let's let that sit for a second. This was really tight, so I'm going to get it hot. You're talking about barrel temps under firing. What do you guys do to measure that? Do you guys employ thermal imaging here? Oh, well, they thermal couples. They type thermal couples and use so, to model the behavior of the core barrel. So you literally put a thermal couple on the barrel as you're firing it? You can mount multiple all over the barrel. Yep. It takes what, like 15 readings a second or something? Like yeah, granted it's not ideal because they're still getting external barrel temperature, you're not getting internal, you know? Um, people have done it for like where you'll drill a little bit into the actual wall, but then you have to deal with, and you also have to consider the wall thickness that you're taking away. All right, so now as that expands after it dries, it's gonna be super rigid because that aluminum will shrink down. Mm -hmm. That barrel ain't going anywhere. That's one of the problems with the r It's also what makes it so easy to work on. You can, you can do this in the back of your truck in the field if you have basic tools. Adult Legos. In some ways, so like this, that's what's that. that. Just to kind of get everything settled. You're just stealing some heat off of there. Yep. And that's fine. We'll, we'll heat it. Not going to hurt it. It's, it's going to get hot anyway. I'm going to use back to the barrel nut. And remember I talked about where you put any type of anti-seize. Mm -hmm. So obviously that collar in here is going to interface with the front facing portion of that collar there mm -hmm. and that's really where it's going to get galling can occur and that's when guys twist their barrel and snap the indexing pin okay let's get one of these bad boys so you don't need a whole lot of this stuff but getting it on that front facing portion is important it's just enough that the Torque can get transferred through, but you're not having the metals lock onto each other as right. you're trying to torque it. Yeah, the best way to, I think, to describe a barrel to the average person is it's just like a massive tuning fork. You heat up a tuning fork, it's going to have a different... Do you know anything about what you're talking about? Frequency. What do you say? Do you know anything about what you're no, talking about? No, not at all. They just actually a pretty just hired face me here. off Craigslist. Just a pretty <laughs> face with halfway <laughs> decent bicep. You're an engineer, though. <laughs> I am. You yeah. actually went to school, studied yep. engineering. Went, uh, got a bachelor's in mechanical engineering, and I uh, decided to apply it to something that I love. So, really, what we're trying to do is just 
figure out what works. And the core series is, it, from what I can tell, the best option barrel-wise of something that actually works. It, it's, it's design makes sense. Uh, when we hooked up the thermocouples, uh, comparative to you know other contours like the government profile, um, you're gonna even heat distribution. Uh, it's incredibly important. Uh, natural frequency is gonna be incredibly important. We linked up with actually a couple people who are, how do you explain it? They are modeling bullet behavior and I should say barrel behavior as the bullet is in the barrel. So That's what crazy. they did is they hooked up a chronograph. So like, let's say this is your barrel and you're shooting off, you know, the barrel you're shooting from. They have a chronograph right here and they have an oscilloscope that takes over, it's, it's over a million samples per second. So that's how, that's how crazy this is. So he has a chronograph right here, starts the test, ends the test the minute the bullet passes the chronograph. So the data that we're actually capturing is as the bullet's in the barrel. You know, so we're able to model and essentially see fractions of fractions, fractions of seconds. Because it, the time, I mean, you have every force going against you. You have pressure, you have heat, you have friction, a list of vibration. You, every bad force that exists that exists in this world is essentially happening in the barrel. And I like friction. Do, Friction's my friend, man. What are you doing? I'm just mounting the uh, gas tube into the gas block. So that's another thing I'm, I'm kind of particular about. I'm particular about everything on the F-15. Yeah. But I'm a big fan of stainless steel gas tubes over like nitride variants. Nitride hardens things. It makes it more rigid. Raw stainless steel, it has a little bit of flex to it, which is ideal. Okay. Um, and I'll show you in a second. So if you have any torque on your gas tube, especially like as it goes this over. This is interesting. This as is it goes over the barrel nut and into the upper receiver, if it's like torqued, it's putting tension on the barrel. It's literally like a lever pushing right. onto it. Okay. So if you, and again, barrels are like giant tuning forks that launch bullets. If you touch the barrel, you change its behavior. So. Which is why we could decided we like free floating barrels and. Right on. Yeah. So yeah. if you have torque on your gas tube, which is a piece of steel, your barrel is not free floated, right? So you're going to like, automatically like. You go from a quarter inch shooting gun to a two inch gun. Like really? That. Yeah. No shit. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, and especially as that barrel heats up and cools off, it expands like any other steel. That's why they have like, you know, relief cuts and bridges and stuff like that. Just like Legos for adults. It's physics, right? That's the number by the end of this. <laughs> so, how are you. So, what you can do, you actually, you know. You're just using. Listen, listen literally rattling as it's going into the upper so that there's no tension on that cast tube okay that's what i look for Certainly, and if there was what would you do i would bend the barrel okay bend the gas tube like relieve that tension i want to make it nice and perfect you can you can flex a little bit so eliminating that torque and tension on the gas tube goes like an extremely long way in making sure that your barrel is going to be vibrating exactly consistently and there's no weird tension I so, dig it. It really comes down to repeatability. That's how you get consistency and precision. So then with mounting the set screws, this is like another thing too. Or I had a gunsmith call me today and said that he used red Loctite on his screws. He drilled and pinned his gas block and he staked the screws. He drilled through so, it and pinned it into correct. the barrel? So yeah, he drilled a hole through the gas block and the barrel and pinned it like he would an old fixed front sight post. And then he staked his set screws after applying red Loctite to them, which is like, I have to heat that up with a blowtorch for five minutes, which may retemper your barrel steel. Yeah, why would you do that? It's just like a little ridiculous. So the way that we recommend mounting a gas block to a barrel is the same way that Crane does it for special forces. It's just with a set screw and some thread lock. So uh, I think what I just heard there, just because somebody's a gunsmith doesn't mean they know what the they're doing. Yeah, I would say that most gunsmiths that I encounter may not have like a comprehensive understanding of what makes these guns shine. They can put them together. They may even check headspace. But you'd be surprised how many builds I get from gunsmiths that like the headspace is not even close. You know, AR-15s do have a mil spec standard, so it's harder to mess them up. Mm -hmm. But you still have to check things. Like you have six thousandths of variance in your headspace. That's six thousandths of slop, chamber pressures, inconsistency. How thick is a depths. human hair? 
Yeah, it's, how it's, thick it's, is one? That's for Google. Well, um, I just meant just for people to understand like what six thousandths means. It's, it's minimal. It's minimal. But what are you talking about? Pressures? I mean, that's that's an inch divided six thousand times, right? Yeah. Or you you get a guy who wants a quarter inch shooting gun. But then they're complaining about how they're getting an inch and a half group. And it's like, well, in order to get your gun from an inch and a half to a quarter inch, you're just going to have to make things more consistent. You take the exact same barrel, the exact same gas block, gas, same gas, you can work with it. But you eliminate little variables. Mm -hmm. It's not just block. about having the fanciest parts. It's how oh, those yeah. are parts. Uh, Ruger made the Saint. Correct. couple years ago. That's a, like a freaking, I think it, that thing is advertised like a third of a minute. And... So they clearly, and they do it for what, a thousand bucks or less. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the longevity is of the gun or its overall durability, but they, the engineers clearly looked at like what's the, to get that reliability. What'd you figure out? I'm looking it up right now. No, you weren't. You were Facebooking over here. <laughs> <laughs> so you use blue, it looks like, not yeah. red. Yeah, I mean, and, and even with blue Loctite, Typically, you're going to have to... So he's talking about six block. human hairs, essentially. Six. About six average, medium-sized human hairs. That's a, that's a teller. To so all this, I just, I'm sitting here, it's, it's, it's snug up to the barrel. You don't have to sit there and try to drill it through the barrel. It's just snug, right? Okay. It's not going anywhere. Once that dries, there's, there's some blue lactate that's seeping in between the gas block and the barrel itself. It's going to dry and be very tight fitment. The only way that that screw's come out is if you actually break the seal, mm -hmm. and it's underneath your handguard. Yeah. To, and if you want to twist this, you have to snap a screw. So guys who like, they think they're building a gun for like the Doomsday Apocalypse or whatever, man, if your if your gas block shifts so bad that it snaps a screw, you're probably gonna have to worry about something else besides just the gas block, right? In, in the classes that we do, that's the number one failure that we see is. Loose gas blocks, but sure. gas blocks, you know, all yeah, of a sudden exactly. sun, gun stop cycling. I usually look in and see the gas exactly. block when falling I, when off. When I removed this one, it was fairly loose, but I'm also seeing really minimal, there's like no thread lock around them. But with the dimple that in the barrel, that, that screw's recessing into the barrel, and it's totally locked in there. Plus, when the barrel heats up, steel expands. Mm -hmm. So that fitment gets even tighter under use. So... We run them on machine guns, never had a gas block walk off on me, as long as you just put a little thread locker, snug it up to the barrel, and call it a day. Mm -hmm. As long as that's, that set screw is processing into the temple. The second set screw indexes off the barrel's exterior, so you have two different planes that that gas block's being held onto the barrel. Good set screw designs will bite into the barrel just a little bit. They're extremely durable. So, it's just one of those simple things. Now you have continuous taper, nicely free floated gas tube that barrel is going to be nice and consistent as it vibrates go back a second when you tighten this on what um so yeah guys guys talk about like what you torque your barrel nut to or yeah. whatever the mill spec standard is between 30 and 80 that's a huge swing huge right so typically i like to go to the higher end of whatever the manufacturer for the barrel nut recommends so with like i believe this is an aluminum barrel nut which I'm not a huge fan of, uh, just because the thermal expansion is a little bit different. It doesn't act as a heat sink, and it's not quite as rigid. Damn it. So, not to knock on Radiant. Radiant makes amazing parts, and their guns are super accurate. I have no doubt that this will shoot well. Geisley has aluminum barrel nuts. ADM has his aluminum barrel nuts. It's very common, and it also keeps it lighter. But if you look at some designs like, uh, like BCM, for instance, they have a little much shorter steel barrel nuts. Mm -hmm for what it is it's super rigid and uh, it will keep things very consistent with your barrel as it heats and cools and everything else i dig it so what we got for shims here what do you need a shim typically i just find i like to time my muzzle device are you you're right or left handed both okay which one do you typically shoot left okay so then you know obviously the way that that muzzle device is you can see there's different lengths to those mm -hmm. tines on the on the flash hider. Gases are going to begin to escape from the shortest one first. All right, so that's one thing you can do is time that like that if you're a left-handed shooter, like that if you're a right-handed shooter. So you're allowing most of the forces to go Correct. in the direction. So kind of like if you've ever seen like a war comp where they have like sure. ports on one side 
it does help just to give you a little bit more smooth, consistent recoil. Plus, if you're shooting in the prone, I always like to have a tine on the bottom because it reduces like dust. Sure, dust. that makes so good sense. That's why I time. So you're going to use the shim so that you can stop that Correct. where you uh, want and it. I'll, and I'll see where it's at just by putting it on. And we'll see. This can sometimes be like a little tedious because you got to find the perfect shim stack. But just break off a chunk of toothpick in yeah, January. It's not, it's not so you know what so I mean? you got a little bit of carbon build up because you probably already had some stuff in there. I'm just going to clean that out. My gun, carbon? No way. And I really appreciate this. I thought we were just oh, going to yeah. swap a barrel out. Are. You guys are... this, this is it. I mean, like, there's a, there's a right and a wrong way to do things. So, I mean, this is beautiful. I well, I always looked at it like it was just Legos for adults, so... Face. That's what this is. That's what this video is going to be titled: Legos for Adults. We're almost there. Just a couple. Of yeah. The nice thing about Mike's experience is that he's able to see really what people are building and how they're building them. Yeah, and that's that's what I mean. When I get to rip apart a gun, that's I don't care what makes them run as well as much as what makes them fail. Yeah. Because that will make You're them like doing an autopsy every single time. Ultimately, yeah. What are the most common mistakes you see besides headspace? Obviously. Yeah, headspace is like critical and constantly messed up. So we got like one more little shim in there and we'll be good. But one, one of the cool things about <laughs> working in the barrel world is you're like Switzerland. So like there's not that many barrel manufacturers and we supply barrels to a whole lot of like rifle manufacturers. Mm -hmm. So we get to get, you know, get our hands on all different types of stuff. We get to help rifle manufacturers kind of like develop their systems and get them more accurate and dialed in. I can talk to them about all these little details. So when they're designing stuff, you know, we have a ton of say in what kind of what, like, hey man, like maybe you should use steel or maybe you should use, use a raw stainless steel instead of nitride, for instance. Give it a try. So they'll send me like a gun that they've built up and I can go over stuff. You know, a lot of, a lot of guys have like weird contraptions that like clamp onto the gas tube or and it's like if you eliminate that your gun will shoot better and also like why is it why are you touching that anyway yeah why are you doing do it for you so and yeah like you mentioned like it doesn't have to be like a gucci gun honestly oh i have tons of ar-15s i have i have radians i have adms i have like the nicest you know some of the nicest guns out there sure. as far as like cost is concerned i basically shoot mil spec guns that i have Good barrels are barrels, you know what I'm saying? And they're just built right. And I don't care about what they look like per se. It's, it, there's nothing wrong with a billet gun. Typically, billet is not as strong, so it's usually thicker. When they have to build it, thick is heavy. That's not something I'm interested in either. So, like, just some of the some of the stuff. I like lightweight because I use guns everywhere all the time. If I go on a hike for 12 miles, there's a gun on me somewhere. It's probably in my pack. You know what I'm saying? And I'm gonna go out and shoot in the middle of nowhere. I don't want to have to carry needless weight. You know what I'm saying? That makes sense. So this is just about good to go. And I bet How you much torque do you put on that thing? Very little. Very little. You do not need to sit there and crank on it. That's one of the main accuracy killers too. Like bench rest shooters literally put their muzzle devices on hand tight. So you don't need much. Now when you're, when you're running a like a flash hider as a suppressor mount, it's a little bit more important depending on the design. So like this one's a direct thread. If you don't put enough torque and rock set on it, when you're unscrewing your suppressor, you might unscrew your muzzle device too. So you want to avoid that. You know what I'm saying? Not much torque, though. Usually it's like 20 foot pounds. Keep it pretty light. So this stuff's just like a water soluble like thread locker. Two part? No, it's just one part. Yep, it's just a just a liquid how, that, you, that you How can, is that pretty, differ than Loctite? So this stuff's water soluble. It's also very heat resistant. A lot of guys use these on their set screws for their gas blocks, which I don't like because it's water soluble. So depending on what you do, I shoot in the rain. We, we shoot in the rain all the time. So over time, that would degrade. I'm not as concerned about it on my muzzle device because it's not like a critical to function thing. Whereas your gas block, that is critical to function. I want a gas gun, not a bolt gun. So I want to make sure that that stays on. Uh, but for a, for a muzzle device, this stuff, because it handles heat really well, is what I recommend. And you can be pretty generous with it too. Do you have a favorite maker of it? No, I don't even know. I think Rock Set's actually like a... There's the manufacturer. Yeah, it's like, it's like Loctite. It's, okay. I'm sure Surefire includes it. They're most of the Yeah, I mean, this is a Surefire branded one because it comes in their 
muzzle devices, and I mount up so many other muzzle devices that I have excess of this stuff. But hey, Andrew. Andrew's cool. Actually, the owner of Superbell used to be their vice president. Mm, really? Yeah. So this is a fair amount, just kind of getting that on. Okay, yeah, you slathered that up pretty good. Yeah. So, and, just, I mean, and it comes off, like you guys talk about having to like soak it in water and stuff like that to get the muzzle device off. I have never done that. I just remove it like normal. I mean, you've got a good fixture there where you're not oh, yeah. clamping things into vices incorrectly and breaking Correct. Parts so that, and, it's just a Geisley reaction rod. They're awesome. They help to... They actually index inside the barrel extensors, so you're not twisting on the upper receiver. It's like great. That. It's a much better design. Why do you like that over just grabbing onto the... Oh, you could. Yeah, you can do that I'm too. just asking. Yeah, either, either way. So that's just like a three-prong, and it makes it real easy for me. This way is the exact same thing, but again, I'm not putting a ton of torque on it. It's not like I can... All right, so actually, I'm going to put another shim in there. Because they crushed a little bit? Yep, they crushed a little bit. I think I was telling you, so we run a zeroing component of class mm -hmm. where we... How oh, that's lined up now? You don't point that barrel at me. You're holding it like it's your weenus. <laughs> I see it. But yeah. So with these things too, like a lot of guys use torque wrenches on everything. They get kind of paranoid about stuff. If you build enough guns, you can kind of feel threat engagement. Sure. That's really all I go for. I go so for torque specs again like you guys are saying consistency to have the tool is giving you some level of consistency absolutely like if you don't if you don't do this every day use your torque wrench use understood torch. The, i mean like not that my cans are calibrated or something like that but you see these they're registered <laughs> torque wrenches <laughs> i just go for snug engaging those threads i use thread locker they're never going to come out. Pretty much you just said that your hands are calibrated. I wouldn't go that far, but no, they're definitely calibrated. How much does this weigh? Just hold it and tell me. It's like, I am going to take the bolt out of this thing and drop it in that carrier. So you so your radiant stuff. So when you do this, what you're talking about, this um, uh, fitment between the, the bolt and the uh, barrel, what are you changing or adjusting? So, so when we get bolts in, for instance, we measure every lug and every bolt. We measure to the bolt face. We come up with an exact measurement for this bolt. Even on like the from the best manufacturers, there can be quite a bit of variance. So I don't want to start my rifle build with three thousandths of variance, because like I said, if you shoot a lot, you're going to get you know minimum, but like five ten thousandths of headspace erosion every couple thousand rounds, mm. which which adds up over time. So, I mean, if you shoot like we do, you could get three thousands of variants fairly quickly. Mm. Yeah. Think so about it like a wick almost. It's it's only disintegrating. It's Correct. only degrading. Correct. Correct. It's think of it like a wick. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you're you only have so much, stuff. and every time you shoot, you're going to wear a little bit more and a little bit more. So what he's doing is he's not actually adjusting anything. Is that he was talking about bolt variants? So you're going to have variants in these lugs, um, and you're going to have variants in that depth as well. And what he's doing is he's finding a tolerance per bolt that works with that particular barrel. Because our barrels as well, everything, doesn't matter what it is, it's always going to have variance in manufacturing. Nothing's the same. Sure. Nothing's exactly the same. So, so do you take doing, a... Go ahead. Yeah, he's using a gauge, a uh, go and a no-go gauge, to find a range at which a bolt will fall in um, that is per SAMI spec. And you can kind of go into that a little bit more. Somebody that's trying to do this themselves and they've just got a bolt, does that mean send it back and ask for another? It's going to be a problem. So, I mean, like, in theory, you could order 10 bolts and none of them would be an ideal fitment for your barrel. So that's one of the reasons we, like, if you buy a barrel off our website, if you would said add a headspace bolt, do it. I mean, it is uh, not, it's not do you guys? So you guys do that? We have hundreds of bolts. 
you know, if not thousands. So yeah. we're, we're able to go through, you know, 50 bolts if need be and find one that pairs perfectly to your barrel. So did you have to take the bolt and then the barrel that you just put on the gun yep. and then you measured them both and found two that match? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, so yep. what, I, what I did is I, I went, I, got, I found a bolt that was a tight closure so I can actually feel all the lug engagement right on a go gauge. So on a 1.4646 go gauge, it was a tight closure. So now that's, you're looking at about a thousandth of clearance. Again, my, my sweet calibrated hands, about a thousandth of clearance just by feel versus you could still be within Sammy specs and have a much wider tolerance to begin with. But why would you start with sloppy tolerance? I agree. You're going to get there. You're going to get there fast enough if you shoot. And a lot of times what you can do is like if you shoot eight or 10,000 rounds through a barrel and groups start to open up a little bit, check your headspace. It's one of those things you can you can find another bolt that's a little bit bigger and re-headspace it and now you're back down to a thousand. How does a guy in any town USA check their headspace? Head With headspace space. gauges. Okay, so where does somebody buy a headspace gauge? You can get them from like Forrester or Climber or GGS okay. or PTG. They're all over the place. And what's like a go go you recommend? Yeah, so I mean like the tolerances that we hold on our barrels is a 1.4646 go spec. So it spins on that. Correct. Y your bolt will close on, on a 1.4646. It will not close on a 1.4646. Do you have one back here? The gauges? Yeah. Yeah, you want to go grab yeah. them, dude? Yeah, of Headspace gauges, they just, they look like that, right? That's not at all what I thought it was going to be. Nothing crazy. But, but basically, this is taking that measurement from the bolt face. Mm -hmm. to the datum line in the chamber. So that's, that's where the shoulder comes up and prevents your cartridge from moving forward any further, right? So you want to get that perfect perf perfect measurement. But ultimately, you can take... So gauge. red is no-go. In a perfect world, we're going we're gonna to first remove the, the extractor and the ejector. We're going to have just a bald bolt, and then you're not going to have any resistance. You can do it when you have the ejector and the extractor on there. If you have a little bit of strength, you can just defeat that and push So you're forward. just pushing. Correct, you push all the way forward. This is not an ideal way, but this is a no-go, so it's not turning, right? So there's a 1.476. 1. Or 1, 1. If you want it to turn. No, there's a no-go okay. gauge. Not, that, that bolt is not turning. I didn't think you'd want it to turn. But if you take your go gauge, your 1.4646, suddenly it turns. So that's only a 3,000 tolerance gap, and I can feel this one it's probably like a thou and a half of variance. So this is not quite as tight. So so between these two different barrels from two different production runs, two different models, a half a thou. And that's typically like, our machinists are like world class. They, they hold exceptionally tight tolerance. So if you take my bolt. So I take your bolt, it may, it may be within tolerance still. Just wondering though. But this is a no-go gauge, and this is not on your new barrel, but. Being, this is a lot looser. I see it's that still it was tolerance. It's still within tolerance. So you can shoot this thing all day, and it would be it would be okay. See how that freely spun though? Mm -hmm. It didn't take much resistance. So so now you have like you know just from that ten thousand rounds or wherever you had through here, you can actually see that bolt wear, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that's going to give you more variance in your chamber pressure fluctuations and your seating depths. Sometimes guys will hear a discussion like this, and they're like, "Oh my, f such and such gun never is." And it really just means they haven't shot it enough, right? Correct. Or they yeah. don't know what to look for. Yeah. I mean, you start running a gun hard, that's like when you start to see failures. I'm sure you see that in your classes. Sure. One thing you should hit on, on, I think, is gas rings. Yeah, that's another, that's another huge thing. So, like, you I, should actually take them to your class, man. You probably fix a lot of shitty guns. <laughs> that we're, shooting we're, not, shit. we're not gunsmithing. Yeah, but it, honestly, what, how long does it take to swap out there? I mean, it's like, it's like seconds. I mean, literally, you can just take something like a dental pick and you can just pop that stuff off in seconds. It literally just go underneath there and pop off those gas rings. Mm -hmm. And then you can throw on a new one. It's something that I do, like, because I shoot suppressed a lot. I literally swap out my gas rings like every thousand rounds. Because they're so cheap, right? I mean, you can buy an enormous bag of them. There is no reason not to have super tight gas ring, gas ring seal. Is there a negative to have super tight gas rings? No, no. So I mean, guys are like, oh, it's so smooth, it's broken in. Yeah, if it was so tight that it would like impede function, but that would be like an auto spec. It's something like something would be off there. Rings. Your motor. Right, I want, I want the compression. Yep. And this, this is, this does form the piston in your AR-15, so. 
So that little tiny, it always comes down to something and that little tiny frickin' fraction of a penny part. Correct. If it's wore out. Yeah. So you would re replace them every thousand rounds. I mean, thousand or two thousand, but it's very frequently because, especially if we're doing like a demo, right? And someone's like, hey, drop down and give me a five round groove, right? <laughs> I want to shoot a quarter inch group in front of them. I do not want to have something nasty or throw a flyer because I'm getting some weird chamber pressure fluctuations. And a flyer for me would be like, I don't want to have a half an inch group. I don't, that, that'd, that'd be embarrassing for me. Not that I'm that good of a shooter. I wish I was that good. Pretty sure he just said that. <laughs> but still, like I want to make it as good as possible, right? Every single time. Sure. And I know, I know that when I'm doing my part, the gun should have, you know, I want to be the, the variable in my group size. I don't want the gun. I want to eliminate every single variable I possibly can, both for reliability and for, and for accuracy. I dig it. So, did you throw that new BCM bolt in there? Yeah, sweet. I didn't put anything there. No, it's cool. cool. Do you even know how to do that? No. Yeah. No, I just started yesterday. Basically <laughs> like Legos. I told you, man, I'm, I'm a Craigslist employee. It is like Legos for, for guys. Girls well, the cool thing is, I do like about that, if you've ever been to, like, Legoland, there's some pretty intricate shit that's built. Sure. And then you can go to some retard's house that can't even <laughs> build, like, the little T-Rex that's got 36 pieces in it. Yeah. Or whatever true. it is. So it could that be. That was how I grew you know what? up. <laughs> you, you can judge a person by how they're going to build. You totally can. You can tell. Oh, I do every day. I, I mean, like, if you think that you're going to send your guns to me, I'm not going to judge you. I mean, whether it's good or bad. You're wrong. But nonetheless, it, we're all learning together. I mean, it's like... Well, I think I'm, part of this is also, like, we're talking about having the right tools and equipment, but the know-how, too. So, wait, what are you replacing? I'm just replacing the cam pin. So, the cam pin was loose? It's loose. And also, this is one of the parts that commonly breaks, just because it's constantly moving. So, if that cam pin's loose, we just start to get those inconsistencies. Yeah. And there's just, again, there's no reason not to replace yeah. it. You can buy these off, you know, many different websites for cheap, like mill spec. But I'm also replacing your firing pin, just because you're getting some you're getting some pitting on that firing pin. Mm. Nothing crazy, but and, and you could totally use that. But uh, you might as well while you're here. I like it. Do you see a lot of cam pin shear? Yeah, I mean it's, it's one of the things that you can break, especially if you start to have a gun with with loose headspace and you get pressure fluctuations. It, 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 one of the failure points. We saw one of those break this past winter. Mm -hmm. Sheared yeah. off, yeah. Yeah, not totally uncommon. Or you'll just break the bolt in half right at the camp. It's definitely seen bolts sla snap in half a handful of times. So now now you have quite a bit more tension there. Mmm, pressure. Right. Nothing crazy, but it's enough now where it's going to be more consistent chain of pressures. And then we're going down. There's another thing I don't like. I, so, like, it, dirty guns are awesome because when you're using your gun, but I dislike when I hear dudes say that they never clean their guns. Oh, that's just stupid. It's stupid. That the guys are idiots. Yeah. The, the thing is, like, if you're using your gun for, like, a range toy and it's nothing more and you have no expectations, cool, cool. But if it's, like, a serious tool for you, like a fighting rifle, now you're, like, you're a jackass. You're basically saying, like, I don't know when my gun's going to break. I never, I che I never check my tire pressure, pressure before a road trip. Exactly. Yeah, or, more importantly, like a race. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, okay. Yeah, it's stupid. I understand if you're trying to torture test something, sure. which yeah. kind of became like a thing for a little while. Yeah, totally different. But yeah, and, and at a certain point, at a certain point, like you want to push your gun to kind of see where it fails because it, it will eventually. You know, you run a gun completely bone stock dry for two thousand rounds, it's gonna get sluggish. You know, but no dry. No dry. Yeah, I mean, I'll let you move this thing up, but... I'll slather that thing up. Now you can see, like, your, your gas strings are going to... Nice Whoa. and tight in there. So, it's good. Really good. All right. Bam. That's awesome. So you think this thing will shoot better? I do. You got an H2 in there. Here you go. You're probably going to notice this is going to be a little bit better balance you, just from picking it up. Uh, not actually, this barrel this barrel is not totally uh, unintelligently designed at all. It's similar to the Corsairs. 
<laughs> what are you looking for? I'm looking for the lens, uh, it, like past the throat, and this barrel is completely toasted. Toasted? Yeah, it's... Alright, well good, it wasn't just me. When you're taking that borescope and you're looking around, all of these should be concentric. And what I mean by that is that you should have equal spacing and it should be a, like a cir circumference line. So all of those, those lands and grooves are gonna have the same starting point. Um, what I saw in your barrel was they'd start, one would start here, and it was kind of faded out. You know, it's a shop barrel, so it's hard to, hard to see. One would start here, and one may start here. So that means you're kind of at an offset from your starting point. So that means that this is en engaging before this. So this would engage, this would engage, and this would engage. Mm -hmm. um, it, kind of think about it as you're throwing a football, you know? You, you, you want everything to flow, and you want all of those to be engaged to get a perfect spin. And you don't want, uh, what this could potentially do is put uh, some strange torque on your projectile going down the barrel. So that's why it's incredibly important that you start off with a concentric throat. So all those lands are at the same same portion, or I'm sorry, at the same starting point, and the barrel's entry into the rifling is going to be consistent uniformly around that barrel. The barrel we just put in your gun is a chrome line barrel. I thought people don't want chrome line for accuracy. So uh, that's typically true. So we do, we do things a little bit different when it comes to chrome lining. We actually hand lap the bores prior to applying the chrome. So it's perfectly uniform before we add chrome. And then we have a way that's proprietary. Can't that talk about it. Can't talk about it because it's our secret squirrel stuff. But it's it, it basically applies the chrome in a completely uniform manner. So there's no thin spots or thick spots in the chrome lining itself. It's not your standard barrel chrome either. Not at all. And that's one thing that, that we took upon ourselves is that working with the chrome liner, in unison as as a team effort so the chrome miner that we use has dod contracts up the butt i mean they're a legitimate incredible uh incredible chrome liner so what we're able to do now is that we're we are able to essentially hold and tell i can tell you chrome lining thickness within a tenth or two of what it's going to end up so you know what's before, a tenth or two mean uh ten thousandth of an inch you know, so the, we're, our accuracy when it comes to chrome lining is spot on. So when I say like a tenth or two, we're able to hold our final bore and groove diameter to about a tenth or plus or minus to, let's say, two tenths, which is incredible. Um, and it's only getting refined. And this is on our, you know, we've never produced more barrels ever. And we're, we're able to hold accuracy that we've never been able to hold before. So should this chrome line barrel last longer than the stainless significantly barrel longer. significantly yeah and also so i mean like like i mentioned when you hand lap the bore and it's perfectly uniform when you apply the chrome it's perfectly uniform you don't have any thin spots in the chrome the way that a chrome line barrel gets shot out is typically you get cracking in the chrome and then eventually you're going to chip and once a chrome line barrel chips you'll never have the same level of accuracy with a stainless steel barrel or a nitride barrel that's been stained you know a stainless steel nitride barrel they wear a little differently. When they start getting shot out, the throat begins to look like the surface of the desert. You get a lot of heat cracking, mm. and then typically you'll see a drop off in accuracy there. So all things being equal, it's really hard to beat the durability and the corrosion resistance of chrome-lined phosphate-coated barrels. That's why the military uses them on everything. Uh, but the tolerances, the internal tolerances, are held to the exact same standards. So we have like national match championships that have been won with chrome lining. So why the, why the argument that chrome lining is not what you want if you're building like a accurate gun? I, because this is with most manufacturers, like uh, say like a cold hammer forged barrel. It's a great way to make a barrel. It takes seconds compared to like our process. But there can be all types of machining marks in the actual rifling prior to chrome lining and then when they put the chrome lining on it's it, just it frequently looks real frosty like okay. a grayish in color if you look at like you know you can actually even see probably in there it's nice it's like it's like a mirror finish i did notice right? that when so we looked at it high, highly highly polished because of the fact that it's going on something that's super precision polished to begin with and the way that that we put the chrome lining in the barrel is is so precise that there's no variance in that surface finish so that's why it's like a mirror uh, and that helps with your barrel to bullet engagement you're not going to have like bullet defamation or stripping small pieces of the jacketing material from the bullet off as it goes down the barrel mm. 
with traditional chrome lining practices, yeah, it has a reputation for poor accuracy and it's well earned. Not that they're bad, but you can get a quarter inch shooting chrome line barrel. We do it every day. You guys keep saying quarter, half, yeah. et cetera. So explain just real quick what that means when you say that. Yeah, so I mean like, uh, you know, people generally judge uh, a barrel on its accuracy. That's really what you're looking for. Also, it should be flawlessly reliable. But, you know, what makes our barrels different is that they're more accurate. For a very long time, the military had, had like absurd accuracy requirements, like four MOA. So, I mean, which is huge. Which is enormous. So if you're talking about somebody who is using a gun for anything serious, and I'm not talking about winning championships, you know, at a competition, but if you're using a gun for a living, which is really at the end of the day, like the, the, the pinnacle of where we're looking for, uh, it can save lives. So as somebody who takes that seriously, is a 4MOA gun good enough for you? Man, it wouldn't be good enough for me. Why shoot so at 100 yards, that means? Why shoot somebody in the face when you can shoot them in the pupil? Sure. It's, it's, called, it's called taking a little bit of personal responsibility, which is really what gun ownership's all about. Right? It's got heavy in this gun room. Yeah, but it, it's, it's real. It's real. Like, like, like if people take their tools seriously, sure. they're going to understand that you know when they pay a little bit more for our barrel, they're getting some Is it really that much more though? Is it like you know in the no, no. market space? Or are you guys? We're comparable. It's, it's not like twice as much or something. No, not at all. I, I would say, you know, I think it's a fair price for. I think it's a very fair price for. What yeah, you're I mean, if you're looking for like a chromine barrel, our right now our prices are two eighty nine ninety nine. We haven't raised prices for a very long. You're time. talking about for like an AR barrel, yeah, like we're for, working. for like the barrel you just put on your gun. So I mean, like, yeah, could you go out and buy a hundred and twenty dollar barrel? Yep, you can, but. All of those refining steps that we, you know, put into our barrel are, are going to be skipped. We will still shoot absolutely. Do you guys do stuff like this? Oh yeah, yeah. When well, I mean, we make barrels for everyone, so like our bread and butter, like the vast majority of our business, eighty percent plus is for rifle manufacturers that don't name us. So we're out, we're everywhere, everywhere. Like you, you've shot many Criterion barrels without knowing it. If you've shot guns in your life, sure. Um, and then a very small portion of our business is like, you know, stock models, like our core series or our hybrid barrels. And then we can sell them to distributors like Optics Planet, Brownells, Primary Arms, those types of places. So that's just a very small portion of our business as a whole. How do people find you guys? The internet. <laughs> CriterionBarrels.com. The internet. Yeah. Email and Mike at CriterionBarrels.com. Yeah. <laughs> We'd love to answer any of your questions. <laughs> is that really his email? Mm -hmm. That's what? really it. I'll give you his number too. If you, want. Yeah, so maybe, maybe you can contact, if you make contact with Criterion in any way, you'll make contact with me. So that's, yeah. that's fine. I'm, I'm, I'm very easy. Man. What fine. is your job here? Oof. Oh, that's a good question. I, I, do, I do a bunch of stuff. I, and also I try to do as much as I can. So I mean like everything from like marketing and sales to tech support, customer service, new product, new product design is a big part. Like, you know, things like the core barrel, uh, all the testing and evaluation, things like that, working with OEM rifle manufacturers and, and helping to fine tune their products. So I'm not really just like, if it's got a trigger, I like it. So I think that's kind of like my, my thing, I guess. What so, do you do here? Uh, all quality. Uh, quality, new product development, uh, a lot of testing, um, but my main emphasis is on, is on quality. And we work, we work hand in hand because like everything that we do, we kind of keep each, each other honest too, you know, so. Yeah, if he sees any, any issues on his end, he always regurgitates that to me and then I go, you know, I, whether, whatever issue it may be, uh, we essentially team up, you know, he's, he's essentially the one that talks to the end user directly and uh, we go and combat that immediately, you know, implement new procedures, um, new processes, um, also, you know, new product development, like I said before, uh, the Core Series, that's our recent recent uh, barrel that came out, best-selling best Yeah, selling we just have, sense. we have a ton of new products too. So like with the last two years, demand has been higher than at any point in history, sure. including both world wars, right? So I mean, we're selling millions and millions of, of guns monthly to, you know, U.S. citizens, which is awesome. Uh, but that's put a huge amount of stress on anyone who's involved in the firearms manufacturing world. Mm -hmm. right? So finding things like steel, you know, it takes us a long time. A production run could take four months. You know, we're producing thousands and thousands and thousands of barrels, but we have, you know, 
hundred thousand customers waiting for barrels. So I mean, like right now, there's there can be an extensive lead time. These are crazy times. You know, everybody wants to have a gun. Nobody wants to be the last man at the apocalypse without one, right? These are weird times. Sure. So, yeah, I mean, that's that's we have all these new products that we we want to release. They're being tested right now. It's hard to release a new product when people have been waiting for an existing stock model for six months. Right. It doesn't go over well with customers. And yeah, we totally yeah, yeah. understand that. But when things hopefully uh, stabilize once again, we're going to move forward and we have all types of new stuff that we're going to be, you know, releasing to the public. So That's cool. The best is yet to come for sure. So. I like it. Yeah. Hi, this is Chef Ken at Z Catering, and I'm here with my great friend Jeff Smith of Colorado Craft Beef. We are both here at the Carry Trainer S12 event in November 2021, and we are showcasing TA Target's grill that they sent out. Incredible grill, incredible beef for an incredible event. Uh, Jeff, you want to talk a little bit about the beef? Yeah, so today we are actually going to be using a flat iron steak for a steak salad that Chef Kent personally designed. Uh, we're going to be putting these steaks on the TA Target's grills. They're running about 600 degrees right now. The flat iron steak is the second most tender steak on the animal. Uh, there's enough steak here that that's all the flat iron from about six steers. So when we start to think about the level of care that goes into the event from the food, the great vendors like TA Target's, the care we get from Carrie Trainer, it's uh, second to none. We're going to showcase two of their grill tops, uh, one a flat grill, and then a second one will be a great, both fantastic. Last night we were getting temperatures of 900, right? I believe we did get to 900. Uh, <laughs> the steaks cooked pretty well. 